Right, guys, welcome to another episode of the Hack Check Podcast. I've got a very special guest today, uh, David Mehausen. I hope I said that correctly. Mehausen. Mehausen. Uh, nice to meet you, David. Nice to meet you, man. Yeah, thanks so much for coming on the show. Yeah, no stress, man. Dude, uh, I was saying to you in the lift, like, uh, <laughs> I didn't know if you were going to fit through the door because uh, <laughs> of your height. Um, you said you were 207. Yeah. Jeez, dude, that's you're, the, you're probably the tallest person I've ever met in my life. I've I've, I've got that once or twice, you know. Like uh, it's 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 always an, it's always such an interesting thing because it's the thing like obviously people notice about like me first, and it and what's even more interesting is when people congratulate you <laughs> on being tall. They're like, "Wow, you're so tall! Like, well done!" And I'm like, well, "Yeah, <laughs> like it's like it's it's I have absolutely no control over it." But I'm like, "Cool, yeah, you know, I'll I'll take credit for this, mm. like." had nothing to do with genetics or <laughs> just existing but your you know, parents yeah so so when you were a kid was it, i'm sure it was probably like dude you probably heard it all the time david you're gonna play rugby oh never never like it was it was no okay i don't want to say never but like rugby was like never my thing growing up like it was i was tall and it was like uh there was high jump basketball was the one that everyone like goes to mm. Um, but no, I mean, it's a weird thing. You would have thought like, yeah, people would be, I think it might've been, I was like, incredibly skinny, like yeah. incredibly skinny. So it's like, maybe that's why it was never the rugby, but no, it, it was surprising. Like most people that ask basketball or get something off the top shelf, but it was never, <laughs> it was never really like, yeah, you're going to play rugby. Yeah. So, so when did you start playing rugby then? Was it? So, I mean, I, I've, I've played rugby since I was a lighty, like young started i mean most kids we started like what, eight years old mm -hmm. when you're playing without uh, yeah literally like seven aside on a cold saturday morning um and then it was in my final it was in my final year of school um leading into matric that like uh, i was at paul boys and the mm -hmm. head the head coach there sean erasmus he like approached me and he's like listen man you're quite a tall individual like would you be at all interested in trying out for the first team like we think you'd be quite good and at the time, like I was uh, taking canoeing very seriously. It had been like my sport since I was seven. Like that was the sport that I was had always done. I was like, that was the sport I was going to carry on to in like for the rest of my life. And I was just like, you know what? Let me give it a rest for a year mm. because I really wanted to play in schools at yeah. Paul, which yeah. is like the um, biggest game in the world. Anyone who knows schoolboy rugby in South Africa knows Paul Boys Parkham is a massive game. Yeah. And like if you're in the school as well. The vibe in the stadium, the whole week building up to that game, it's just electric. So yeah. it's like something you want to be a part of. Um, and so I was like, yeah, let me give one year of rugby a try. And then that just kind of set the wheels in motion to chance to continue. And next thing I know, I was starting on the path to having a career in rugby. So so what what team did you play before that? I mean, I was not G team. Yeah. In under 16? In under 19. So, like, in my grade 11, yeah, I played G team for Paul Boys, yeah. That's a big step up to go from the ninth team to the first team. Like, did you – were you just gone through the system where people didn't see you or – yeah, did something I, just switch? Like? I, I think I think I just kind of made the decision to go for rugby at that point. Like I said, like I, I, rugby had never like been my big sport. I mean, sports was always my thing. Like I'd always wanted to be a professional sportsman, no matter like what it was. But rugby was never really the sport that I kind of like thought this would be the way I was mm. going to take it. And then. Yeah, in my I, I didn't even I think I played five first team games. I played second team most of my my high school my final year of school, mm -hmm. um, and it was just I was in the the first team set system up. set up. Yeah, and so like I, the you do like a preseason and camps and all that. And I think like obviously that kind of extra training and time really helped develop me from being a g team player to being able to play second and first team in my final year mm. and uh, did you actually play in the inter schools it's for the second team I okay. Didn't, I, okay i mean still you're still, still playing, in front of the crowd you're still really. playing in front of the crowd which was absolutely incredible um and uh i've still one of like my most cherished like schoolboy rugby memories but no i didn't get to play for the first team unfortunately and craven week and all that kind of stuff did you no not okay no, none of that so 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 usually in the schoolboy setup, like, because I also went to boys' school, mm. and you'll see guys, they'll, they'll play, like, first team, maybe fringe, and then go Craven Week, and then from there get scouted and everything. Yeah. You got scouted, uh, if, I, if I remember correctly. Yeah. Um, 
how did that happen? Um, did they come watch the games or what so was, was the process like then going from school to Stormers? So, I mean, it was, I was, Paul was in my matric year, we had an exceptional year in that, I think it was the first time in 43 years that we went like completely undefeated for the season. Wow. So we were number one in the country. We had a phenomenal year. Um, and because the first team had such phenomenal success, um, the it really brought uh, it shone a light on our, our rugby system and the coach Sean, what he had done at Paul Boys and the Western Province Institute, um, who like basically takes school boys and then because there's there was under, at the time there was under nineteen rugby mm -hmm. um, clubs for Stormers, Lions, Sharks, etc. and they approached him and said like, do you know a lock? that because they needed to fill one more spot and wow. he suggested me to them. And so they came to me and they were like, yeah, listen, well, Sean speaks very highly of you. We've what they came to, I remember, I think it was Tigerberg. Or it was like one of my, one of my five first team games. Like he pulled me aside right before the game. He was like, listen, you need to play well. Cause there's like a scout, scout. here to like, like in the movies. see whether or not you're actually going to play. <laughs> like, Make or like, break. They want to know if you're good enough. And so I was like, oh geez, I actually got to like perform today. Um, and they were, yeah, they obviously liked what they saw. And then they, I remember they, they pulled me. So I think it was like a week, week and a half later, they called me in. They're like, listen, we'd like to offer you a place here, but just know when you get here, like you're going to have to work. Mm. Like you, we've never offered this to a second team player before. I mean, all the guys that were going there were SA schools or Cra yeah. Craven week or at least first team. Mm. And I was coming in as a second team player. So I knew when I arrived, like I was at the bottom of the feeding barrel. And you had to, to work extra hard to make it. Yeah. Uh, and and how long were you in the system before you actually made uh, your debut, say for in the Curry Cup or uh, Super Rugby? So, I would say, I mean, it's it's kind of hard. It's I wouldn't say like yeah, it's it's a hard thing to say because I was kind of in and out of the system in the sense of so I played that entire year under nineteen, um, but I mean I think I played I played three games for Western Province in the sense that like I said I was the bottom of the bottom. Um, I was the seventh choice of seven locks, like, and we f went through the whole season, didn't play a single game. And then when we finally got to the point where they were just as rugby is, there's so many injuries, we ran out of locks. They were like, okay, well, here's your, here's here's your, chance. Here's your chance. Another chance. Um, and, uh, played, uh, relatively well in like two of the games, um, and then got a chance to actually start in the final and then had an absolute shocker, like mm. one of the worst games I've ever played in my life and um didn't get signed by western province so i was i didn't have a contract or anything i was i wasn't in the setup anymore with western province mm. and i was looking to go study that had always been the plan afterwards and so um i had spoken to marty's at the time um and uct as to like because a lot of the players at the institute were being approached by the universities mm -hmm. would you like a bursary and all of that and i was studying actually at marty's at the time and so i approached the i think it was the under 20s coach at marty's and i was like he took me around he showed me the facilities and i was like well okay and what about a bursary and he's like listen man like you're not good enough for a bursary like wow. we we're not gonna like there's better players we're gonna take straight like up. he told us straight up and like to be fair that's what he that's his that was his gut and he went with what he thought was the right move for him. So, mm. and then UCT came and they said to me, "No, listen, we really want you the fir for the first team setup. Like, we'll give you a bursary if you come here." And it wow. was, I was still very hesitant, but like, it just felt like the right decision. Mm. Got called, don't know why, and one of the best decisions I ever made. Um, I went to UCT, started out in their second team as well because they had like obviously they're building young players yeah. to like come through. Um, and then managed to slowly my, make my way into their first team. Um, and then about halfway through like the internal league um, during that season, the Western Province under 21 coach happened to be at one of the games and he saw me and he was like, well, let's, let's bring you into the under 21 setup. And then played for the under 21 setup for two years. And then it was in my final year of playing under 21 that I got my first Curry Cup cap. And then the following year, um, my first Stormers cap. Wow. And, and what was the step up like, you know, from under 21 to, to the first team? Massive, massive. It's, it's a massive jump from 
being in a pool of guys who are not like they're the best of their age group to the best of every age group. Yeah. You're dealing with 15 years of the, the best players beating the best players in that, in that league. So to go from junior under the steps from Craven week to under 19, then under 19 to 21 and then under 21 to the first curry cup. And then from curry cup to stormers as well, it's just the jumps just keep getting bigger mm. and bigger. And so, no, it was, it was a massive adjustment. Who were the locks at the time? Was it, it was Etzebeth and... Etzebeth, uh, Chris Van Sale. Um, it was uh, John Klain, uh, oh. Corbus Visa. Oh, yeah, okay. Um, and then, obviously, Salmon Morat was also there. Yeah, so it was... It was a whole a, host of yeah, current host and of former Springboks yeah. and future Springboks at the time. Big, big, big guys, yeah. Wow. And um, so how long was your, was your say, professional career... Um, the whole span of it so about four years about four years yeah and um you had to retire early um at a young age and um from from too many concussions yes uh, is was it was it uh diagnosis anything like is it is it cte or what exactly uh what exactly is it is it just too many successive concussions or it was uh, i i decided to consult uh a neurologist just because I'd had a lot of concussions and you obviously just want to make sure that your health is all in check. And so I had sat down with a neuropsychiatrist, um, psychologist, neuropsychologist, and just basically she did some tests on me um, to basically see like where my cognitive level was. Um, and sh her initial diagnosis was straight away. She was like, she was straight away like when she heard how many concussions I because I think I had had eleven concussions. Wow! Um, and she's like, anywhere over six, you need to retire. Like, and so for me, I was like, okay, that's that's not what you want to hear. But at the same time, I feel like any br brain special medical brain specialist is going to be very adverse mm. a contact sport mm. because we know we know there's negative effects of any form of high impact to the brains mm. but it's more of it but a uh, lots of people they go their entire lives and they're fine yeah and so it's just was i going to be one of those cases on the bad side was i going to be like a u.s fund of estes and or a dotty weir or was i going to be someone who could mm. play the, my entire career and not have horrible side effects and so we decided then okay i spoke to the medical team at western at the stormers and we decided, okay, we need to go and see like a neurologist and get a, a proper opinion. Um, and in, so it, it takes a, often like a long time to get in to see a neurologist because they're just so highly specialized and it takes like months to get in. But luckily pulled some strings, managed to get like the weight down to three weeks. Mm. I was gonna see um, a Dr. Gardner in Constantia. And during that time, still playing for the Stormers, all of that. And then we traveled to Ireland and played against Connacht and during the game i got tackled in the chest mm. and the resulting whiplash gave me a mild concussion something that should never oh. have like never have given me a mild concussion yeah. it was just it wasn't it wasn't like i blacked out it w i didn't lose consciousness but anyone who's had a concussion or felt that type of you'll know you know straight away what it feels like mm. it's this weird uneasy feeling of you're not 100 percent. you're not you just the edges aren't a little bit sharp or maybe you're just everything is point zero zero of a second delayed or something it's just that you don't feel 100 something's just off something's off mm. and you can't really put your finger on it and for me i was like this feels like a very mild concussion passed all my tests but i just still didn't feel good so decided to wait until i'd seen the specialist before come returning to play um saw the specialist two weeks later and he was shame. He was a, he was an incredible guy, very friendly, and you could see he was very much trying to. He was on your side. He was on my side. He mm. was he he wanted me. He was not he was not anti rugby. He was not he was not like uh, over like, cautious. Yeah, or like uh, like it's a horrible thing to be playing contact sports, and he was completely understanding. But at the same time, he was saying this doesn't look good. Yeah. And then after about forty five minutes of tests and all of that, I eventually said to him like, okay, well we've been around the bush i need point blank what is your advice and he said listen if you were someone who i cared about this isn't a this isn't even a discussion you're done mm. and so for me 
that was just it was as simple as it needed to be in the sense of it was heartbreaking absolutely devastating yeah, something that i like worked towards like i was living my dream of being a professional athlete but then to be told like but to be told that your health is in jeopardy and mm. that your your quality of life could be affected no not worth it so within 45 minutes yeah my career was done wow had you had you had so, so what made you see the specialist had you just got a feeling uh, or i mean had you started to see long sort of effects outside of mm. getting the concussion um like was was there some sort of a uh, i don't know how to put it like uh just in your everyday life like a trigger yeah were there, or were there things like that you would normally be able to do that now all of a sudden maybe you know you were a little bit sluggish or you had mm. headaches or something like that that it was it was more of just a, a general concern for my overall overall mental state. I mean, I'd done a lot of research on CTE and like concussions and all of that, and I know that one of the big things is it it affects your mental state, your 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 mental well being and all of that. And I went through a very bad depressive episode in uh, 2021, the end of 2021, where I was incredibly depressed mm. and. I didn't know if it was a result of just because some people it it can be as a result of you get it's passed on through genes or yep. whatever but or it could I didn't know if it was a result of the concussions or what so I was like let me actually just check that this these concussions aren't exacerbating what is there already mm. and so it was more just trying to look after my mental well-being and fixing making sure that i'm in the best mental and physical state possible mm. and so it was i sent myself to get checked just yeah. because i wanted to make i i mean anyone who's struggled with any mental illness will tell you it's not it's not a place you want to be mm. in and you will try and fight tooth and nail to stop going back there yeah so it was uh, and so it was just it was yeah it was a decision i made and then when the call came that it was like listen we think you should retire then it was it was it was a hard but an inevitably easy one. Mm, yeah. No, look, I mean, your health is a, there's a saying, your health is your wealth. And I think now in modern day, it's good that there is so much research out there about CTE, about concussions, about brain trauma, mental health, because um, in a lot of sports, you know, American football, um, professional wrestling, um, even rugby, you know, mm. it's also a lot of tough guy sports where guys would like tough it out. Yeah. And, you know, put the sport before their health and, now we've got the head impact assessments in rugby, um, you know, and all, all the research on head trauma. Um, it is a lot uh, better now, I think, you know, for people who, who are experiencing that to not have to feel like, oh, no, I need to tough it out or put my health at risk, yeah. you know, for the team or for the sport. And I think, yeah, it's obviously it's obviously better now than it was, uh, you know, years back. And, and the long-term effects that those people have that maybe – didn't have the the research at the time mm. um it's it's heartbreaking to see the people who who didn't take the step to take a step back that now go forward yeah. um with it and then so after you retired um what did you what made you decide to travel or was it an instant decision or um what were you doing after you retired was it just yeah i think the when when I retired, it was it was it was very abrupt. So it wasn't it wasn't. I think most people, first of all, sportsmen, we retire way younger than everyone else. So it's like, but so you know, the end of your career is coming like way younger than someone who's let's say at a desk job who's going to retire at fifty five. So mm. there is this kind of like preparedness to retire at like, and I said retire, at like thirty five or whatever age. But mm. it was at least you have some kind of like, oh, you know, it's coming. I'm starting bodies. Like, it, I mean, anyone, if you're doing a contact sport, you'll hear guys always complain like, yes, my body's just so much sore than it was when I was like 25 years old. Yeah. Or, and so it was, it was so abrupt that I had no idea what to do with my life. I was, I was just what, well, what comes now? Mm. And the, the initial thing that comes from i think m a lot of players in rugby is like okay well now do you like transition into coaching or do mm. you transition in some other form of being in the game just not in a player capacity and 
after speaking to a lot of people and uh, the the kind of general consensus that came from the people whose opinion like I really valued was just don't rush into anything. Mm. You've got you've got this kind of blank slate now where you can kind of just figure out what you want to do next. There's you've you've done something that you were truly passionate about for a long time, but now you have no idea what so don't rush into like you don't know if you want to be a coach because you hadn't thought about being a coach for mm. ages or i didn't know if i wanted to go into i know i didn't want to go into a desk job but like yeah, it was like yeah. what what do i want to do next and so the thing that i i kind of then was like okay well what were the things that i'd missed out on whilst being a rugby player and you miss out on a lot of experiences because mm -hmm. you're training all the time you play on the weekends and then you're recovering the next day. And if that, you're not tra like you're traveling to and from games and all of that. And so I felt I had missed a lot of, I'd, I'd missed out on some, quite a few experiences mm -hmm. that I'd wanted to have. So, and traveling had always been a way to provide these just unique and incredible experiences. And so I decided, you know what, let's, let's book a one way ticket and kind of figure out where, where are we going to go for however long take who needs a life savings at 25 you yeah. know like let's go let's go and see the world and so i had never done i'd never really done europe mm -hmm. in the summer and so i just decided you know what let's find the cheapest ticket i can to europe and then we'll kind of take it from there mm. so where all did you go in that on that first trip so i started in uh greece um i did greece albania bulgaria Italy, Montenegro, Spain, France, England, Serbia, uh, Guatemala, Honduras, Nicaragua, Costa Rica, and yeah, I think that's it. Something like 23 countries, I think I saw on the uh, Yeah, on that's, that's across Total. like my entire life. Okay. I think this last trip so I did That 40. was all in that one trip? No, no, no. The, so okay. those 25 countries were like, I've, I've been fortunate enough to go, I did um, like, I got to go to like inter I went to like international mass competitions in like Korea and Taiwan as a kid. I did um, the World Junior like canoeing championships in Czech Republic as oh, well. Yeah? So like I got to do traveling as a kid for like sport and like competitions, which was like an incredible thing. And then my family, we went on a trip to Zanzibar when I was twenty. Mm. But so other uh, which was fantastic. And then the, the World Cup for Japan for rugby. Oh yeah. Um, uh, but so other than that, like this, this was the most traveling I'd ever done, like in terms of like one whole stint. And what's, uh, what's your favorite country then out of all of the, out of the group or where do you prefer to go to? Jeez. I mean, I definitely, I definitely was not the biggest fan of like cities in Europe. I think everyone loves to go like it's, you see like, oh, everyone goes to Europe on like their, their holidays, especially here in South Africa. Like people love to go to Europe or mm. they maybe go to like Southeast Asia. For me, I've just, I've always been like an outdoorsy type of person. And so I wasn't the biggest fan of the Europeans. And it's also so expensive. Yeah, you go with the super. Rand, you struggle. Yeah. Like it is not fun. Um, but then I did get to go to Albania in Europe, which was just an, absolute gem of a find phenomenal country really really cheap and some really great things to do i mean you can hike the, you can be in the alps there you can go to the, the beaches you there's hot springs you visit old towns and mm. castles and you meet some interesting people and drink some horrendous moonshine like it's really uh, yeah there's there's uh, it was a fantastic country and a lot of i met a lot of really interesting people there because also the type of people that are traveling to those types of countries are really interesting people. Mm. Yeah. So, so do you travel alone when you go to these places? Yes. Or yeah. how does that work? So, so kind of just literally you have a bag, you figure out where you want to go the next day and if you want to stay for two or three nights and then you kind of, the nice thing about um, traveling alone is it kind of pushes you out of your comfort zone so you have to make friends with like randoms and like you have to ask locals what are the things to do and you will get people who were telling you like i did this or i hated this or this is really good or you must try this and then you kind of just get a sense of feel of where you need to go to next mm. and it's i mean yeah the the whole the whole point of the way i'm currently traveling at the moment is literally just 
be open to any experience that could come your way. And because of the way I did that, I mean, I got to do some incredible things like on my traveling purely just by not planning ahead, just mm. saying, listen, whatever comes next, that's what, if I like the sound of it, then let's go for it. And, and financially and things like that, when you're in a place, like if there's no end date, um, how easy is it to just keep traveling around and staying there and doing those kinds of things? You know, cause usually like, I'm thinking like if I travel and when, when people pr travel, we're like, okay, we're going there for a week. Yeah. Hotels cost this much. Um, I'm one of those people that likes the cities, but also the rural, but you know, you fly to your hotel, maybe your food and it's like budget this way. But uh, with an open-ended travel like that, like how do you, do you just make friends and go stay at friends? Like how? You kind of sit, you have to set yourself thresholds of like, I just can't go over this. So mm -hmm. like, especially with like, Travel, travel is the one thing where it can get it tough because obviously you're not often in control of what you can spend depending on where you're going. It can maybe be like, I can't go here because of the cost of the travel. Yeah. Or, but in terms of accommodation, you usually, if, if you spend enough time in a certain area, you kind of get an idea of like the threshold of how much let's say a hostel is or how much a meal costs. And then you kind of budget like, okay, I mustn't go over X amount. Mm -hmm. or, so usually hostels, I mean, for me, most of the time, my threshold was like, I wouldn't spend more than $10 on a room for a night. Wow. Like you, and you can find very easily places like that. I mean, it's, it's all about finding like the sense of, how do I say the, what you feel and what you're happy being uncomfortable with. Yeah. For me, I was very happy being uncomfortable with sharing a room with a lot of people, someone snoring, someone, a whole b bunch of randoms having sex in the corner, like really? no <laughs> privacy. Yeah, it's just, it's just, it's kind of, you know, it's the things that happen like of a shared living room. I mean, I got woken up by the police in Al Albania uh, because um, there was, Jeez, it was so it was this American and Russian that kind of had this like argument. Yeah. And the the Russian just just was laughing. And he came downstairs and we asked like, oh, what what was going on? He's like, Oh, this American um basically was saying that I was disrespecting him because I was coming like too close to him. Um and then he kept saying, like, Do you want to fight? Do you want to go? And he was chuckling because he says, Well, in Russia, we don't ask to fight, we yeah. just punch someone in the face. <laughs> and so we all went to bed and then literally 3 a.m. someone's shining a light in my face and I'm pissed now because it's 3 a.m. I open my cupboard and it's the, it's the police, two police, and they say, you have a problem with Russian. I'm like, no, no, no. I, that was not me. I'm that not was American. American. <laughs> and I, I walk out to see just this line of blood coming out of the hostel and the, Mer the Russian is just sitting there, his face completely opened. And the American had just come back and just, Pelted him while he was Pelted sleeping. him like three times, like whilst he was just minding his business and then walked away. That's so crazy, dude. Oh, man. Uh, I was going to ask you what some of your craziest stories are. but Jeez, uh, Yeah, I mean, that was definitely up there with, with one of them. Um, but are the police, I mean, are the police in those countries, are they... Are they like welcoming to foreigners are people welcoming to foreigners are they corrupt you it know, depends it depends what country you're in um some countries they just don't foreigners like they just don't chat to you at all i experienced that a lot more in europe than i did in in central america um people just very closed off to you they don't they they kind of just stick to their own i don't i think it's also a language barrier yeah, like they, they come and like you they it's like Oh, you expect us to speak English, but you come to our country and mm. you can't speak our language. Like so, it was, it was just, yeah. That's I, I think. I mean, I, I shame. I don't want because there were so many people who were so friendly, but at, as a whole, there were often times where yeah, the the general population is quite distant with you. Whereas when you get to like Central America, like the poorer countries, it they're just so friendly, so mm. welcoming. Everyone is just like you know, yeah, just swarm you with love and affection and and there the rule is um like in terms of like whether it's police whether it's gangs whether it's clubs or whatever if you're a tourist no one fucks with you really because we bring the money yeah so okay. they're like, so like thailand yeah they're like you do not fuck with the tourists like mm. it's that simple mm. because yeah if the tourists don't come there's no money yes so exactly and uh do you do you speak any spanish or like how do you get around with the communication and that kind yeah, of thing yeah so i went um when i start i landed in 
Guatemala um, was like my first stop in Central America, and I went there expressly to learn Spanish. There was a, a, a Spanish school that was on this like active volcano, um, like on a lake in the middle of Guatemala, and um, so someone had recommended it to me whilst I was in Albania, and I was like, hell yeah, that sounds unreal. Yeah. So I spent a month there living with like a family um, in like a township in Guatemala. And then like I would walk to the school every single day for like one-on-one -on -one lessons. So yeah, so I studied Spanish for a month there. And then just as you go, you kind of pick it up as you, mm. as you go along, really. Yeah, it's the easiest way to learn a language is when you're there. Because I actually, uh, I went to Middle East for two years after school. And um, I tried to learn Arabic like on the TV and in books and stuff like that. Yeah. And then we were like in an area that had quite a few English speaking people. So people that spoke English and Arabic. Um, and then I picked up a few words, but like they would m see I would struggle and speak English to me. And then we moved to a place that had maybe like five English speakers mm. and you were forced to speak. I was forced to speak Arabic. Yeah. And I think within six, uh, sorry, six months I picked it up. Yeah, it's by far, by far the best way to do it. Yeah, when um, you're thrown in the deep end, you just have to. It's it's sink or swim, yeah. and so it, and sinking's not an option. So it's like you've got to just kind of sort it out. Is it not like a little bit scary to just go to a foreign country like that? You know, especially when you're busy learning. Okay, you went to learn the language, but I mean, my idea of countries like in in South America, Central America, very vast countries like mm. jungles and things like that. Is it is it like that and how easy is it to find your way around and, and travel and safety? Okay, safety seems like it's not a problem. Yeah, I think it's, it's. I mean, obviously, wherever you go, safety can be an issue. It's just depending on like how, like how wise you are. Mm. If you are walking around the street, drunk off your ass at 11 o'clock at night, waving your brand new iPhone anywhere around, in the world, you are, it's gone. Like yeah. it's, that's not smart. But like if you, if you're in with, most of the time, the locals, especially at hostels, are very good at telling you, like, just don't do this. They'll say, like, just don't do this and stay you'll be fine. Stay away from that yeah, area. Yeah, stay away from this or at this time, be back. Like, whether it's, like, be two in the morning or they're just, like, or just don't be, yeah, and most of it is just common sense, to be mm. honest. And then a lot, most of the places you can hitchhike wherever you want to go. Um, or there are, like, very easy bus stations. Bus stations are a big thing to get where, you, like, to and from where where you want to go and the nice thing is like and again i think that's why maybe it was more suited to me it's maybe not everyone's cup of tea but like you said there are jungles and stuff like that which i absolutely loved mm. like i i got to go and do i did like five day jungle excursions i got to go do an excavation in like an underground temple with wow. like and like and it's fantastic. No one tells you this though. The jungle sucks. Like it actually, it it is the worst place to be. Like Why? it's an incredible story. It's and it's fantastic to like talk about afterwards. But everything in the jungle wants to make your life a mis miserable. It if it doesn't want to fucking kill you, it <laughs> wants like there was. We were we were walking. I mean, I I did this. It was like a it was a five day hundred kilometer trek through the jungle Jeez. to get to this. The, it was the center of the Mayan civilization 2,000 years ago mm. um, called El Mirador. And they have one of the biggest pyramids in the world, La Dante, there. And so I've never seen a pyramid before, and this was something I was so excited to do. And you literally, you, you just walk for five days to get to this thing a day. You spend a day there. You're eating nothing but beans, like refried beans and tortillas the entire time. And you are walking with and I, I i'm not exaggerating when i say you have about 300 mosquitoes yeah. behind you whilst you're walking and if you stop walking they will Hit you dive on you like it's they just go there's they're relentless no matter how much bug spray you put on no matter how many layers of clothing They've they evolved. will they will find you and then you think okay fine that's fine okay fine i mosquitoes is the thing i'm fine uh, uh, it's horrendous but you know we can deal with it and then you come across a snake where they're like oh yeah if it kill if it bites you 30 minutes you're dead and you're like okay oh, well no. this is great and then you know what oh thank good a bee oh a bee there's something you know calm and casual i saw this bee this it was like this wasp bee thing and i, and I was 
the the guy grabs me. He's like, no, 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 no. And I'm like, what? He's like, if that thing stings you, you're dead in 15 minutes. Like it closes up your throat and you can't breathe and you die. And I'm just sitting here. That's a bee, man. A bee, it's yeah. a bee. It's not supposed to do that to you. Usually uh, you swell up. Yeah. And that's it. That's so crazy, man. And things like tigers and that kind of thing, are they? So they got you know, jaguars cats? and okay. like panthers. But I think it's, it's more of if you see one, you're lucky. Or if you see one, it's too late. Yeah. Like it's it's the the jungle's so well designed to camouflage. Like there's a reason they're spotted or they're black is because they just fit in so well to the camouflage of the jungle. And it's it's so dense and so thick around you that you you just you're never gonna see them coming. Mm. Everywhere you look, it looks like every tree looks like a snake. Every branch looks like the spots of a jaguar so you your mind is playing tricks on you the whole time and then when it's dark it's pitch black because you're just surrounded there's like no light can come mm. in from the trees above you because it's just so dense and so thick in there i know you guys like elevating off the ground to make sure snakes don't come into the bed like what's your setup when you so we we've got sleeping? tents so you make sure that that thing is closed once it's set up that you do not open unless you are getting in and out of that thing and it is closed the whole night and what's nice is like obviously you they the way they've done it is because el mirador is quite like a big it's a big attraction like mm -hmm. a lot of people go there a lot of people hike there they have the tents set up for you already. Okay. So it's like you don't have to carry your tents with you, but you do have to take all your food and like obviously all your clothes and like if you need extra toilet paper, you got to mm. bring that stuff with. Um, and so yeah, so you bring all of that stuff with you. So what was it like going into the into the temple? What did you see? What is it? I mean, so, how old is it? Yeah. So I mean, it's it, El Mirador was this. It's a it's a city. It's about probably I'd say about five kilometers by about eight kilometers long wide so it's like it's big really it's, a, it's massive like and it's this ancient city that's just completely been taken over by the rainforest the rainforest has grown like regrown over these temples and these monuments so you just see like these anthills with like mm. trees growing on and then some of the the temples are like exposed so like we got to see the temple of the jaguar which is like this the statue of a jaguar but i i say jaguar it's the i if you'd given me 50 guesses i wouldn't have guessed that that was yeah. a jaguar but that's supposed it's like the way they designed it in the mayan time and then you see these they have these uh, murals of like depicting the gods and their stories and the kings and then you get and then la dante which is this massive pyramid you the guy who also only speaks Spanish. So that's where, like, you have, like you say, you have to, it's sink or swim. Like, yeah. if you don't, if you can't, You're sit there yeah, clueless. you absolutely You're not have enjoy no clue. It. It's like the amount of attention you pay during your school field trips, absolutely zero. Yeah. And you, so you, he, we get to the, t we get to the pyramid. I say pyramid because there was no pyramid in front of us. And he's like, okay, cool. We're starting here. And I'm looking around and it's just jungle and there's these like, they've built these wooden steps going up this like, it's a hill, it looks mm. like a hill. So we're like, okay, I assume the temples, like, the pyramids on top of this hill. So we hike up, nothing, jungle. We walk for about five minutes through the jungle. We come to another set of stairs, hike up the stairs. And then there's this very obvious pyramid mm. that's sticking up like above the trees. But it's about 30 meters, high and i'm like this is the, I, the i was promised one of the biggest pyramids in the world where the hell is this thing and so i asked him where where's the pyramid he's like no, no no those stairs we started on that was the beginning of the pyramid the rainforest has just covered the whole wow. pyramid so it be over two thousand years the entire rainforest has just come in and taken over this entire city and only the top the, the pyramid is 77 meters high you can only see the last 30 meters that's crazy, man. And and can you, you you can't roam freely, or I mean, how do you ac can you access and go in, or so not not there. There was nowhere there to like go into a temple or something. Everything was kind of above, like it was just the uh, the outer layer. Um, but I was very fortunate in that. So I I'd, I'd had a discussion with, and again, it was just like through conversations. I met this guy who spoke to me about this archaeological dig that they were currently doing in um, another part of this, in this place called Hormel, which mm -hmm. is this brand new excavation site. It's like, the, well, it's not a new excavation site, but it's like a new, 
they'd found a new temple. A new discovery, basically. A new discovery, basically, like in the last two th two years. And they were busy, like, excavating it. And he he said, listen, would you be at all interested in coming to see this? And I was like, hell yeah. Like, mm, this is... Of course. Of course I want to see it. I want to be Indiana Jones. Man. Yeah, and, <laughs> exactly. And so he literally the day i got back from this five day jungle trek he calls me and he's like listen we need your passport and you need to be ready to go tomorrow and all i wanted was a bloody coke and like a snickers bar or something like that bar one would have gone down like yeah. a treat but it was it no respite literally got in a car drove a day to get to this next um to meet my guide mm -hmm. and then he takes me to the site and we arrive to find the army is like guarding the entrance to this supposed it's they're guarding to the jungle yeah so we get there after about like 45 minutes of explaining like no listen the white guy is allowed in because it's again like if you're not from there and you're not like it's a protected site they're like this guy is clearly not from guatemala he can't come mm. in and eventually they're like, no, okay, fine. Like, I'm, I'm sure a bribe was slipped somewhere. And then allegedly, alleged, allegedly, allegedly, we'll say. Um, and then we drive probably about another hour and a half on this really shitty road through the jungle, and we get to this beautiful lake, like absolutely stunning, with like garden grass around it. And he's like, okay, cool, perfect. Um, get out. I'm like, is, is that it? We're here. And he's like, no, no, no. Now, now the hike starts. And I'm like, he's like, listen, we can either do it tomorrow mm. or we can do it today. And the sun is like About to basically go gone. And I'm like, well, what do you think? Like, wh what would you recommend? And now the, the one thing they told me on the last hike, the one, the five-day journey was, at night, you stay in camp. Mm. You do not want to be in the jungle at night. It is the worst place to be because just it, the danger just... Setting target. You are literally like, everything can see you and you can't see yeah. it. And you have no idea where you are. And he's like, no, no, we should go now. So I'm like, okay, do you know what? This is why we're doing this. Yeah, we're, no. doing, we're doing it for adventure. You know, we're here, to, we're here to have adventures. And so we set off. And probably about 30 minutes into the walk, it's pitch black. He whips out a couple of head torches. We put the torches on. Cool. Following the trail. Probably walking about another 45 minutes. He turns to me and he says, I think I know a shortcut. Let's, oh, just, no. let's cut through here. So we leave the path to like go into the full-on, like full-on bunda bashing. Like we've got our machetes. We're hacking through the jungle. Probably walking about 15 minutes. He turns around and he goes, Yeah, we're lost. Oh uh, no. Just the two of you. Just the two of us. Oh, uh, dude. And and the nearest person to us is forty kilometers away. Wow. So now I'm I'm breaking it. I don't know what. Like I'm I'm mentally writing my will. Like where, I'm gonna stick it on a tree somewhere here. Like <laughs> where, where? Like how do how do I explain? How did you get in this situation? How I, yeah. How did I how do I explain that I died in the jungle just because I was like let's not wait till morning to yeah. go hiking. So he's like, you stay here. Oh, no. I'm going to go and find the path. So you're going to leave me alone. But <laughs> okay. <laughs> so I'm holding my machete for all it's worth. Yeah, probably shaking. Like, if, if, if anything comes my way, I'm, I'm just swinging. About five minutes later, I hear him calling out like, I'm over here. I'm over here. Come here. Come Bolting. running. He found the path. Oh, wow. And we, so we make it through. We get to camp, I pass out. The amount of adrenaline that was coursing through my my body at that moment just could have, I mean, crack crack addicts could have used that to get an <laughs> adrenaline like a high. Like yeah. I I could have strangled the tiger right there. Yeah, and woke up the next day and to go to this excavation site. And so they didn't they didn't really basically they just told me that i was going to see it was called the tomb of the three serpent kings and they didn't really tell me what i was going to see and so we they showed me the the they had a like a makeshift tent mm. of all the artifacts that they had taken out of this temple that hadn't gone to the museum 
so they've taken all like the good stuff to the museum already but like all the pots and pans that weren't like supposed to be good enough and like some of these are like incredible mine works of art mm. that just haven't been taken to the museum yet because they're not like pretty enough museum or they, they have a crack or in the wrong place or something like that and then we go we go on this to find this temple and again it's 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 another city but that's completely covered by the rainforest so you can see like these bumps and then you see like a little bit of like brick every now and again but nothing again it's you can see it's a city but you can't see completely anything covered. besides the rainforest and then we there's this they were there, they built these wooden steps going into just this black cave like and so but like on this raised anthill so i'm like awesome sounds this, fun this, this this should be fun and so we go in and it's just this long hallway of about like 20 meters and then at the end they had that it was it was such a not a surreal moment but i had to laugh because they would built these like they built this white plastic door to kind of like keep grave robbers out yeah so it was it was this like fake very very fake door it's surrounded by like this incredibly old rustic yeah yeah like temple, centuries temple, old centuries old temple and then this like you know those white plastic chairs yeah. you kind of sit on when yeah, you turn yeah. around a fire and that and was what was guarding ones. this door and so he opened well this temple and he, 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 <laughs> he opens he and it's like this flimsy lock on it so he opens it and it's just stairs going down like underground and then bats just like f are flying out coming past you and you we climb down and it's just it opens up to be this hallway with these like if you imagine like these indiana jones yeah. temples like like i'm talking like full-on statues of these three serpent kings no way from two two and a half thousand years ago so incredibly well preserved and underneath them is the story of the gods that like kind of lived there like the mayan gods and then underneath that was a list of every single mayan king who had come before them wow dude and just st as someone who's like a full-on history nerd yep. to see this stuff i it was one of the greatest days of my life i was just sitting there like i don't care i got lost in the jungle last night like this is this is how the story goes like the story it wouldn't be it wouldn't be the story if you know you didn't have some trial to get to yeah. to this point and it was just to see these incredible works of art thousands of years old not in a museum not hadn't been preserved at all by anything other than time mm. and the the fact that no one knew where this temple was and then to see these incredible works of art was just something to behold like yeah dude i can imagine i mean especially like you say you're into history and to be able to see it i mean it's mythical actually because all the whole the whole Mayan history um is one of those mythical bits of history that that you know you 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 watch like an indiana jones and they they go a little bit over the top yeah with a lot of the things you know like the crystal skulls and all of that kind of stuff but like to see it be real and depicted in say indiana jones and be so close to real life or mm. the real life being so close to the movie must have been something surreal and what do they do with do they just keep it there what do they do after like after you find something like that you say some of the stuff got sent to the museum but like yeah. those statues you probably can't remove them they no, probably just no, stay they, right then, there then then I, I mean i highly d unless the the british national history, history museum gets a visa to go to guatemala i don't think it's getting taken out anytime soon um but it's no i i assume it's just going to stay there and it's going to be one of these until they I don't think I don't know what they can do with it because they can't move it. Mm. So the only thing I could think they would maybe do is like start working to build some kind of tourist for people to like walk there, hike yeah. there, and then come and see. Like Egypt, this. yeah. Man, that's so crazy. That's a once in a lifetime experience, man. Oh, I can see how you would jump so. it at the opportunity to do that. And uh, your next trip, where are you off to? South America. Again? Yeah. No, so this was Central America. Right. Okay. So, yeah, so I was uh, like just, I never, I, the plan was to make it to South America, but didn't get to go this time. Um, but now it's, uh, yeah, I'll leave in two weeks for South America. Where are you off to? Which part? Starting in Colombia. 
um, and then just basically heading south. The plan is to hopefully do at least a year and a half wow. of just kind of like trekking in between all the different places and getting to know the culture and then slowly making my way to end off in um, Patagonia and then try and join an expedition to Antarctica. Wow, dude, to Antarctica, man. It's, it's, we it's, it's, man, I, it's so crazy to hear you talk like about all these countries. Cause like when I, again, when I think of all these countries, it's just like this far distant place and like yeah. Colombia, obviously think straight away of Pablo Escobar and like, yeah. it's not safe and things like that. Um, you obviously not concerned about safety at no, all there. Or, not at all. Oh man, that's, that's going to be, that's going to be an incredible trip to see. Um, and and Antarctica, what are you gonna what are you gonna go do that side? I have no clue, to be honest. It's just more of it's it's been my grandfather and I have always spoken about Antarctica, and I mean I read like reading uh, Robert Falcon Scott's like Journey to the South Pole and like how he we like if he made like made it and mm. died afterwards and and just like the this untouched area of land where there's just so much unknown about it and so much I think still to kind of find out but at the same time it's a completely hostile environment mm. it's, it's a like if you're not careful it can very easily kill you and it's these it's these types of like journeys to like figuring out like just having these unforeseen adventure which excites me about traveling and i think i'll get that in antarctica no 100 percent unplanned and as rugged as it gets basically yeah pretty you should much. start a tv show man I, you should like, pitch it to somebody. I, uh, who, who do we chat to? Netflix about getting something like this. Yeah, on the, on some the, of the studios around around Cape Town. Yeah, why not, man? And um, you don't think you could turn it into like a career? Do you want to do something like that, or you just you're just taking it as it comes now? I, I would love to, to be honest. I mean, it's it's something that I I love. I, I've absolutely love this traveling aspect of it, and but I and you see so many people. The only real aspect of it I see is like on social media of people making it a career, whether it be YouTube or Instagram or TikTok now is massive. And mm -hmm. so, I mean, I've never been one for social media, like big on social media, but since I started doing this, I'll just post something every day because if this turns into a viable source of income from being on social media, then fantastic. And mm. I enjoy that, like the creation side of showing like what I'm doing and what I've done. And it's also like a nice reminder for me to go back and look at the stuff I've done. Mm. But I have no idea how to really make it, not to make it a viable source of income, but how I would, what is the way I would want to make it mm. my like career or like the way I want. And there's, there, at the moment, there's not, I wouldn't say there's the pressure of having to do it because I'm still, I'm in a very fortunate position and because I was a professional athlete and I saved all of my money. Now I'm at the, um, I'm like, okay, well, I, I, I didn't know what I was saving that for, but now I'm saving it to spend, to, to experience the world. Mm. And so when I need, to, when I need to be earning money, then I, hopefully I will have learned whilst traveling, f found a way to make it, mm. make it a, a viable source of income. And maybe, like you say, maybe if this is something that people want to see, maybe then I chat to, a studio or someone about filming some kind of show and showcasing because i think the big thing is people people are worried about like you say people are worried about their safety of going to these countries and it's it's really not the case they're mm. just it's such incredible vibrant people and and the funny thing is it's also i have to convince people there to come to south africa because this is such a fantastic country and yep. we have like we have so much to offer here but people are very scared to come mm. here they're very nervous of coming here because they speak they they think about the danger but like we live here and we know it's yes it's got its problems and i mean if there they can be dangerous but it can also be incredible mm. so i think that's anywhere in the world and it's just how you go about it if you're wise if you're if you sensible and if you also just have a little bit of a tasteful adventure, you can you can see some incredible things and meet incredible people and experience. It's a big world and there's yeah, a lot to experience. It is. Yeah. We're fortunate in South Africa, one thing we get taught here is street smarts. Yeah. So we can take that to any any place. But it's if you watch just media, like if you were to just watch news 
or watch TV and you hear the statistics about South Africa, you hear the statistics are what you watch Narcos in Colombia. Yeah. You think, ah, oh, there's not a chance I'm ever going to go there because it's just cartels or it's crime. And then you see a lot of, uh, so YouTube channels, there's a guy, um, I don't know if you've ever seen Kurt Kaz, no. that travels, uh, he, he literally travels to favelas and barrios. And he's like, I'm now in Dominican Republic or in Colombia. He's like, I'm going to go to that barrio and I'm just going to go walk around and see what it is, what it's like. And he is is more, um, I can guarantee he would be more scared to walk around in places that he knows, um, which is but bit of kind of, kind of intuitive but he doesn't know anything about those places yeah. and people are just like excited to see him yeah you know, obviously if it's dangerous they'll say like don't go down that street but it's it's good to see that because like i can see it's a different type of travel like i say i, li- I like the classic places to travel if you want to yeah. call it that and now i'm thinking to myself i want to go to costa rica i want to go to nicaragua i want to go to you know colombia i want to go see these places and i think you could bring a lot of light to to those countries and make people want to go there and and be interested in in seeing what you're doing. So I think you should definitely pursue something like that, man. No, man, I'd love I'd love to shine a light on. I mean, they they're, they're incredible countries, and it's as like for South Africans, I mean, for well for anyone, it's cheap, but for us, it's very feasible because like for us to go to Europe or something like that, it it can be a struggle mm. because you. It we we coming with low purchasing power of the rand and heading over there, but there it's very similar if not cheaper mm. to travel and it's it's yeah it's i think it's the they they of course there'll be the fear of like you don't know like you say but people are so receptive and so people are, i i i still i hold to the the idea that most people are inherently good and yep. they are they want yeah you got a few rotten apples and you've got you get you do get some assholes like i've met assholes while traveling and they, but the pro- you don't focus on them. You mm. focus on the good people and the the incredible experiences you have, and also just kind of broadening what you don't know. You don't know. Mm. Like there's there's so many things to learn and to experience, and you, I I don't think we should let fear kind of hang us up on those things. No, most definitely not. The traveling thing as well, like that temple is really like, that's something I really want to go do. Like, yeah, man. But will they, will they, do you think, how, did they give you like any indication of how long they take to open to the public or anything like that? How long does it, because I'm sure they want to protect it at all costs. Yeah, I sure think, I, I, to be honest, I don't think it's going to be something that's going to be open to the public anytime soon. Like when I was, when I was there, it was so, it was so funny because like they, they have a list of like everyone who's been to the temple. And I was like, Oh, surely I'm the first South African, and there was one other fucking really? South African. I was so bleak that I wasn't the first. Like, to Who see was it? An archaeologist? Ever, it was. I can't even remember his name. It was Richard something, but I remember being like, "Damn you, Richard!" Like I would have <laughs> been the first South African in the world to see this thing. But there was they they couldn't have been more than 250 names. Wow. That it's uh, like so that's people who have seen this thing. So I I highly highly doubt. Mm. That it's something they're just gonna like open to the public anytime soon. And the problem is, it's also. It was, it, it, it they would need to build like a whole sort of like infrastructure mm-hmm. around because the way, the way they've done like the other the other temple that I did, yes, it's, yes you can hike there, but you can also take a helicopter. Okay. Like people people who want alternative to, ways. Yeah, they can pay seven hundred dollars and be there in half an hour. Mm. whereas this is like th- you you have to walk rugged yeah mm-hmm. you have to walk or you take like a jeep like and even that like even then we were like you wading through water like up to here at some points Dude. like you're carrying your bag over your head it sounds like indiana jones though. but it's it, it it feels like it and that's the, but the funny and again it's it's so funny to look back on it because like i love telling the story and i'm so glad that but whilst when you're in it it sucks, sucks. Yeah. like it sucks so much. But and when you look back on it, like you, you look say, back on it, you like you romanticize could it. Could you imagine you couldn't tell that story about getting lost and getting off the trail? Like yeah. if it was just a straightforward thing that you had to do. Yeah, exactly, just another another casual stroll through the jungle. You know? Yeah. Have you got any like crazy stories from your travels? I know you had the story about the police, but is there anything else that's like a really really crazy story? Yeah, I met I met this this really really cool guy um 
Shame, he's all right. Like I've I've actually spoken to him about like how I would tell this story, and he was like, "Listen, if you ever do, just don't leave my name out yep. of it. Don't." Basically, we're not going to bring any light to like who this individual, like who he is. But I was um, I was in Albania, and I met um, met. I ended up I found a travel partner who I was traveling with for three weeks, and then I met this. We met this other guy who joined us for a week, and we did the Alps together and all of that. And he was telling me about this guy. He'd been traveling for a while, and he met said guy in Bulgaria, and who was a bare knuckle boxer from Russia. <laughs> and I was like, that, first of all, that is like, in terms of like, if as, as I'm, I'm, I have no idea about like mixed martial arts and all of that. But when you hear bare knuckle boxer from Russia, you, it just, that screams dangerous, yeah. man. And so I was like, I've, with this, I'm going to be traveling for, months if not years would this guy be able to teach me how to throw a punch you know just so like i can defend myself he said well let's give him a call mm. so I ring him up and he comes on straight away such a nice guy he's like yeah man pull through to bulgaria i'm i'm here uh in sunny beach um you can come i'll train you for a week i'm like awesome literally next day i was in the i was at the like in the middle of the alps in albania at the time Next day, literally took four buses, two planes, 37 hours of travel, wow. arrive in Sunny Beach, 10 p.m. Um, on a, like a Thursday afternoon. I am absolutely exhausted, and this guy meets me at this, um, this restaurant, we, and he says, we're going to start training at 5 a.m. tomorrow, but I, need to, I just need to like, get to know you first. So we sit down and he, he just tells me his life story. And so he he was he fled Armenia when he was five to Russia with his um his grandma his grandfather and his mother. And when he was eighteen, his um grandfather died. Now he had a very close relationship with his grandfather and he took it to heart. Like it was it was mm. tough for him. And so he was kind of looking for some way to vent this anger, to yeah. get rid of this anger. And so there was a boxing gym around the corner that he decided, you know what, punching a bag, probably a good way to get rid of some of that, yep. frustration. that frustration. And so he goes there and I don't know how exactly it came to be, but the, there was a group called the Russian hooligans who saw him and they, he expressed, they were like, you, you have promise. You yeah. have promise. And so, but, the, it's basically a group of 25 individuals who will go into the forest and they fight 25, these 25 guys versus another team of 25, uh, bare knuckle, last team standing wins. That's, that's the only rule. Like, and he showed me like a video of one of his fights and it's literally like, it's not... It's not once a man's down, he's down. Yeah. It's you can do whatever you want. You can stomp on the guy's head. You can have three yeah. versus one. You can do... And once you knock one guy out, you just move on. So it's constantly like five guys versus one. Yeah. Or it's, and it's just barbaric. And he tells me, he, he says he remembers so distinctly waking up, Siberian forest, blanket of snow... And then he's just, he'd been knocked out and like slowly rousing himself. And he just sees like this painted red on top of the snow. And then like just bodies kind of just like littered everywhere. Wow. Um, so he did that for two years. Jo like absolutely, like I said, it was fantastic. You know, like this, this group of, this is camaraderie, yeah, you yeah, know, yeah. With, with your boys. And then after that, he joined, um, he did his conscription with the, the Russian military. Um, and once he was finished with, um, his like conscription, he was like, no, I'm, I'm pretty good. I'm going to stick with the, I'm going to join the special forces. And then he went to go fight ISIS in Syria. Wow. Um, and the stories like, I'm, I'm not going to say any, any, any of the stories there because I really don't feel like Putin coming after me. Or <laughs> yeah. I don't know. Some government. We'll just beep that name. Yeah. 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 It's yeah. coming after me for the, but it's. It's so in interesting to hear, like the the stuff that he went through, just as like a 
a special agent for mm. like the Russian military and he ended up actually leaving the military the Russian army in 2014 because he was like they're going to start killing kids in Ukraine well wow. and this is this is nine years ago and I mean what the Ru the war with Russia like kind of oh like it it went massive what last year and yeah. so this is mm. this is what like years, years in, the, in the, making. the making yeah and no so a phenomenal guy and so so he, but also a crazy life and so he was in bulgaria because he fled the army mm. and so he was yeah and so I, he arrived and he was like yeah listen man i'm so i'm gonna teach you how to punch um and so we spent the next seven days training two and a half hours in the morning two and a half hours in the evening i burnt thirty six thousand calories Crazy. in it was six days of training it was absolutely ridiculous i've did did more push-ups running sit-ups than i've ever done in my life and then just knuckles were bloody yeah. at the end but it was no it was no fighting like mm. there was no actual like i wasn't fighting him like we would like shadow box and that was it mm. but like if it wasn't hitting a bag i was hitting the floor or there was no because i mean the big, the big thing I, I told people, I, like, I'm, oh, I'm going to go do some bare knuckle boxing in Bulgaria. And they're like, you literally quit rugby because of concussions. Yeah. And now yeah. you're going to go do boxing. Yeah. So, no, it was, it, but it worked out. It, it was a fantastic experience and, like, a really incredible guy to meet. Um, and someone who I look forward to, like, seeing again, seeing again in the future. And an incredibly well-read individual who also, it was also so great to have a conversation with him because this was in about july last year when it was still like very tense between russia and ukraine mm. and he was speaking how the amount of issues people have with him purely because he's russian mm. it's he hasn't done anything wrong he hasn't but people like and and the amount of like and i saw it while i was traveling as well if someone said they were russian immediately people mm. are on the back foot or they're offended or they have a problem with you because purely because you're you're russian you've yeah. done nothing wrong half of the people in russia were against what I th more than half were very much against what was happening to the people in ukraine and mm. so it was so it was heartbreaking to see that this man had literally done the right thing to leave the situation and was still getting ostracized for it mm. Yeah, it's sometimes it's just a stigma that gets attached, you know, and it's there's literally nothing you can do about it. I mean, you can't help where you're born, you can't help what passport you have. I know he wasn't born there, but you can't you can't help that. What is he supposed to do? Just give up his citizenship? Yeah. I mean, but what's he doing now? Is he just has he got a school? Is he just so training he, like this every day? No. Or? So he works. He's a he's a pool manager, um, in uh, uh, at a hotel there. Um, and then he's actually he uh, he's been waiting to get his Bulgarian citizen, okay. citizenship. So he's been there for a while. And once he's got his Bulgarian citizenship, the thing was I think it was to get him and his mother. He's trying to get into the U.S. because he wants to be a police officer there. Oh, that's awesome. Um, yeah, he speaks. It was so interesting because it was also it was it was after the it was just after the whole like police brutality thing in the U.S. And he was saying how. He can't believe how much hate there is for the U.S. police force because yeah. yes, yeah, there are issues, and yes, there is a lot of there's a lot of racial tension, and they're completely unacceptable that people are discriminated by the by certain members of the police for their race. But the majority of the police force in America, are, I've, I mean, I've never been, I don't know, mm. but I, I would assume are good hard good. working policemen whereas he says in russia you're more afraid of the police than you are of the mafia wow. because the mafia like at least has some kind of code whereas the police are there to supposedly protect but they're just they're more corrupt than, the than everyone West. else it's like it's they don't it's so he he was for him i think he's like just got the sense of being like a protector and like a honor yeah honor and all of mm. that and so for him he wants to go do that in the u.s that's crazy man and uh is it time for the do you want to tell the german tourist story or <laughs> yeah i, I mean, mean it's it's not my story but it was um so this this guy that i was um traveling with we we ended up traveling together for uh, about three weeks and 
he's he's also lived a, a, like a crazy life like he spent time in like a mexican jail and what? he's um he, he's he was in a gang when he was 13 and it, no crazy crazy life but he was is he so is he from mexico or no he's from england <laughs> the hell, he, dude. he 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 fled uh, not uh, no i lied Didn't, fled is the wrong word he left england after he was in a gang from the time of like 13 to like 17 and then he um got out of that life and he wanted to like kind of create something new so he literally went to mexico was trying to figure out a way to make some money so he was scamming um pool like wristbands yeah, yeah, yeah. for hotels so he would like figure out what color the wristband was for a day go make photocopies and then sell them for like five bucks a pop instead Smart. of like and so he got arrested for doing that after like two years and he spent like a couple of weeks in like a mexican jail but he was he was staying in hostels the entire time whilst he was doing this supposed scam operation this operation yeah that's let's call it that in mexico and he happened to be in a hostel like during lockdown and so now the rooms are like very much empty whilst you because like people are at home people aren't traveling during it's lockdown mm. so but he was locked down in this hostel and it was only him and a 65 year old german man in this room that he was in and every single night without failure this man would call a phone sex operator and jerk off in the middle of the room every night every single night without fail and the problem was like my mate he was trying to he was like can you surely you can put me up in a different room or something he goes, mm. no sorry sir like you are in like it's covid you know you've got to stay in the room that you are assigned for two you're, weeks you're assigned and this is like two months this is two months that Dude. this is i yeah for me i, I don't I, know what I, you would do in that situation like, i don't know like i feel like there's got to be some way to just be like because he's you can't i feel like you can't approach the guy the german guy and say like listen man you know this is not okay yeah. because that's not that's not working obviously yeah. i i very much think he would have told him like listen this is please stop doing this didn't i yeah you, i don't know what you do like light physical violence threat like threaten the guy with the possibility of violence maybe yeah I don't know, maybe. like do that again see what happens maybe i, I think know. i think maybe you've just got to like accept it like whilst he's you want to open the court this curtain and just stare at him and just yeah, like, yeah, see, like likes it that's, that's the, the only issue if he if, if he, he makes if eye it, contact if, if he likes it then you're like okay well now i've opened up a can of worms that i can't fucking put back i yo, i have no idea what i would do in that situation there like it's yeah it's you probably just get used to it man like after a while and you're like well it's night number 45 and <laughs> yeah. he's just doing what he does every night he's just marking another notch on the bed like oh here we go like oh. you know white noise in the background maybe that's the white noise that puts you to sleep oh my knows? word <laughs> no it's just i don't know how that's yeah you're not you're not getting any and apparently it was so it was loud so the guy's like he's the phone's on loud he's obviously and he's he's not like he's having phone sex in German. I know. So uh, I mean, I I have no idea what that would sound like, but I can't imagine it ranks high on on, on nice sounding. Yeah, no, it's not exactly. No offense, Germans, it's, but it's not. I don't think it's um that it's meditating music to put you to sleep. Yeah. Cool, David. I think um that's a good place to call it. I think um we definitely have to do a part two when you get back. <laughs> I'm yeah, looking man. forward, like I'm really looking forward to to see all the places that you go to, and and I actually myself I want to try and head down to South America. So if it's in the next year, year and a half, I'm going to definitely up, message we'll, you that we, we can story. do we can do this. We can do part two down in uh, Argentina somewhere for be like awesome. a steak or something. And then yeah, that'd be awesome. I appreciate the time. Yeah, Thank man. you so much. Thanks so much yeah. for having me. It's been Thanks awesome a lot. To be on, awesome.